So earlier today, Valve held a Q&A for developers in regards to the Steam Deck, Steam Input, and Steamworks features. There are some very, very technical deep dives into the CPU architecture and hardware. There's also a deep dive into the Steam UI and the truth about what you can do in terms of third-party applications. You can watch this entire thing on YouTube if you so desired, but a lot of it, a lot of it is just wait time. A lot of wait time. So as you can see here, Valve is hosting a Q&A session for the Steam Deck. So a lot of this is not just wait time, but also a lot of it is only really useful for developers. Developers that want to make games and publish them on Steam. And if you're one, then you should watch the entire thing, aside from like, you know, their missions. So the first section is how to develop without a dev kit. You wouldn't imagine, you would imagine that developing without a dev kit would be pretty easy considering you're just making PC games and you're just testing for proton compatibility. Valve seems to think that it's not that easy. They want to get, they want to get you set up with a proper desktop testing environment. And so I think they've done a remarkable job. My biggest question though has to do with the CPU, or rather, the computer they recommended. The computer that was recommended was the Minis Forum UM700. This device, or rather, mini PC, comes with an AMD Ryzen 7 3750H, which has 4 cores and 8 threads. It's got 16 gigs of DDR4, and it's got Vega 10 graphics. They say this is the closest device you can get that's readily accessible. Being that I don't have a UM700, I scrambled to find some UM700 benchmarks from the likes of ETA Prime and etc. However, the issue then is that this is running Windows, and their official recommendation is running on Linux. And so while more often than not, you can see the performance differential being within margin of error, the truth of the matter is, is that you need to test this on Linux because there are times where games run faster on Linux than they do on Windows despite being the Windows version. Or the opposite. It really depends on the game. Do keep in mind that this is a Zen Plus, not Zen 2. Zen 2 is on the deck. This is Zen Plus. Basically like Zen 1.5, really. Anyways. Zen Plus is still a pretty good ship. In fact, my laptop currently uses Zen Plus. It's a Ryzen 5 3500U, I believe, with Vega 6 graphics. And honestly, with like a lot of smaller titles, or if I run the resolution down, I've got very little issue with the game itself. Again, I don't have this PC to test out, nor do I really feel like spending $600 on it. So... Honestly, your best bet would be to wait for the numbers to come out, because according to the Windows numbers, the Aya Neo trounces this device, and the Steam Deck trounces the Aya Neo, so it's not even close it's not even close in comparison. As you can see here, that mini PC combined with that tiny monitor and a DualShock 4. All of this together makes for a pretty effective Steam Deck development like hack kit, so to speak. And that monitor is running 1280 by 800 so you know it's of the same resolution. They call it the hack and deck. I prefer calling it the ghetto dev kit. So the next section is a hardware overview of the Steam Deck and this is an overview of what I presume to be the main board because they have an AMD guy for later. So this is the main board right here and this is very interesting stuff but what does this mean for you? Aside from listing out whatever connects to what, it doesn't really serve any purpose to the user, so to speak. Interestingly, this is called the Aerith SoC. You know, like Aerith from uh, Final Fantasy VII. They do mention that the Steam Deck can individually dynamically allocate 
power to individual parts of the SOC. They also mentioned that within the same power budget, they will dynamically allocate most of the energy to the GPU to maintain GPU performance. All in all, it just sounds really standard and nothing really out of the ordinary, but it's good. It's a good thing. Nothing should be out of the ordinary. This is a PC after all. Another thing to note is that Valve says that they have not placed any artificial limits on the power that the deck can consume. So the deck also includes a built-in frame limiter, game agnostic as well I should mention. That way nothing can run above 60 FPS because honestly, that's kind of pointless, especially on a 60Hz display. You can also limit it to 30 FPS as well if you so desire. The most interesting part of this presentation is what they claim to be the game loading time. So we're just gonna totally ignore this graph because this graph actually makes no sense. There's no units on the side or anything of the sort. But according to Valve, they claim that an SD card will only take about 18% more time to load than the 512 gigabyte SSD. So if you do the math, let's say for example a game takes 30 seconds to load on an NVMe SSD. It should take about 35.5 seconds to load on an SD card. Assuming of course you get one that's up to spec. That's pretty impressive showings, but a lot of people are still quite skeptical about running games off SD cards. At least in the PC environment. People have been doing on the Switch for years now. I have every intention of testing out the difference in load time between the eMMC model, the SSD models, and loading off an SD card. In February, that is. So this is the Steam experience on deck, and I believe this is the most important section of the entire presentation for the consumers. So right off the bat, they confirmed that every major feature that's currently on Steam will be available on Steam Deck, such as cloud saves, achievements that are validated by the client, as well as Steam Workshop mods. He also mentioned the community feed is just a few button presses away at all times. Something new is the Steam homepage. The Steam homepage is, well, well, how do I say it? It's a homepage. It brings together your community, your friends, your library, and the store, and it even has a universal search feature. And so you can just find the games on there. There's also a notifications button. Also worth mentioning is this new Steam Deck UI will replace Big Picture mode. And it'll also replace the existing Steam Link interface as well, so it'll all just be one big interface, as they say. Also mentioned here was Steam Input's new UI. So they didn't really talk about new features during this segment, but they did talk about how they're changing how information is presented to you. And making the UI easier to access for anyone with any sort of control, whether it's touchscreen or mouse or controller. In keeping with the goal of unifying the experience on Steam, you can see here that the deck and the desktop mode have the same UI for controllers. Also, a truly massive feature that they announced was Steam Cloud Suspends. Think the Nintendo Switch Suspend. You can press the power button and it just goes into standby, the screen turns off, and the game isn't running, but once you go back to it, the game is back where it was before. Think of that, but on the Steam Deck or your PC, and think of it being cloud syncable between both of those platforms or any number of computers you may own. Imagine playing a game on your computer, having to go somewhere, suspending your game, and then taking it with you on the deck, starting exactly where you left off on your computer. And not just a regular old save file. I mean, exact position, exact everything, you know? Now that is the coolest feature. So this is the secret sauce. This is Proton. Proton is the most important part of Steam Deck. Without Proton, this wouldn't happen at all. This wouldn't work at all. You wouldn't be able to play Windows games on your Steam Deck. You wouldn't be able to play... Well, you wouldn't be able to play most of your Steam library, honestly. Proton is a compatibility layer, not an emulator. The code runs as is, but any API calls are translated into a different more linux e native API call. So Proton has actually been out for several years at this point now, and it's been working great. As you can see here, I've done a lot of tutorials on how to play games on Proton. It just works great. Obviously, anti-cheat games don't quite work yet, but very recently, two major games got anti-cheat support for Proton. 
Ark Survival Evolved and uh, Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord. Obviously more games will follow soon. Also unique to the Steam Deck and also I guess Vulcan as a whole is something called shaders. So as you're playing a game, the game will compile your shader cache and store it on your computer, or in this case your Steam Deck, and it lags your game like there's no there's no tomorrow, and you do have to generate this shader package. There's no way around it. However, being that every Steam Deck will be identical except for the except for the storage, of course, Valve will also ship these shaders to you, and so there's little to no muss and fuss about generating shaders yourself. Honestly, there isn't a whole lot that the user will have to interact with. Although you can use Proton on third-party non-Steam applications, if you were to just install them and add them to Steam yourself, that is, it's pretty easy, I guess. There is an AMD APU for those interested, but you should watch that instead of watching this video because I'm not really going to cover it. There's not really a lot that's user facing. There's no benchmarks or anything of the sort. It's just a deep dive into the architecture and how everything works. And it's really interesting, but it may not be interesting for all gamers. So if you're interested, watch it yourself. Otherwise, I'm going to skip to the next section. So Steam input is very specifically how you play your games. I mean, come on, man. It's your controller stuff. So let me get this out of the way. If you're happy with the way your games are configured out of the box, then good. You don't really need to do anything. You just need to press the buttons as they are, as they would be on Xbox, and you'll be fine. That said, if you're someone looking to get a little more out of your game, whether it's just remapping buttons that you probably can't on a real game, or perhaps something more in case you're playing a non-controller game, that is, then Steam Input is for you. So Steam Input is game specific. You can set controls per game. Your custom controls are per game and you don't have to use one control scheme for every game. So the simplest use for Steam Input is just remapping a control. Maybe you want A to be B and B to A instead. You can do that. It won't change how the game sees your buttons, but you'll you'll feel it, you'll know. You can do far more complex inputs as well, given you put the time in. However, games that properly support native Steam input, instead of assigning buttons to buttons, you instead assign actions to buttons. For instance, instead of mapping like the space bar to A for you to jump, Instead, you can map the jump action to A instead. If you're having a difficult time wrapping your head around this, basically, you just need to play a Steam input game. You'll never want to go back, and it's sad because only like 0.16% of all games on Steam natively support Steam input, and not even all of those games do it properly. One major caveat is a lot of games don't support simultaneous mass controller input, which sounds really stupid in concept, but it makes a lot more sense when I explain it. So imagine having analog movement on your left thumb, but having full mouse aim. That's basically what it is. Games won't let you do that, and a lot of competitive games won't let you do that because obviously mouse and keyboard would trounce controller any day, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for a single player game like Control to not be able to let you use simultaneous mouse and controller support. Also worth mentioning that Gyro is a thing on the Steam Deck, and unlike say the Nintendo Switch or even the DualShock 4, you can have gyros only activate when you have your thumbs on your sticks. That's right, your thumbs have capacitive touch. Meaning you rest your thumb on your stick and gyros on automatically. It's pretty cool. You can turn that off as well if you want gyro always on or if you just don't like gyro. There's nothing that would suggest that you cannot remap the touch capacitive sticks to be any other action instead. Whether or not it's practical or not is a different story, and honestly I'll have to explore that later. Also worth mentioning is that there is a touchscreen on the Steam Deck. Primarily, the touchscreen just acts as a mouse, but the Steam Deck comes with native uh, touchscreen features, so to speak. It's got multi-touch support, basically. 
Valve is currently looking for feedback as to how to make use of the touchscreen so that you can, well, make use of its Steam input. Expand your games even further. One suggestion would be for us to create on-screen buttons for us to press just in case you want to press it. You know what I'm saying? Maybe let us make some radial menus or maybe let us make some touch menus on the touchscreen as well. That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it be? It would make inventory simulator games like Terraria a lot more intuitive. And Starbound too. Starbound is really crazy with how many items you can hold. They also address that yes, you can play local co-op games on your Steam Deck. Of course, I kind of wish they talked about some sort of ad hoc feature. You know, like the Nintendo Switch, or the PSP, or the 3DS, or the PS Vita, or the original DS. So yes, some kind of ad hoc feature would be pretty slick. You know, in case you want a local play but you don't want to break out the old Wi-Fi hotspot or whatever, right? And while you're at it, if you're going to do that, you should also add Remote Play Together via ad hoc. So Remote Play Together is a feature in which you can stream your game to another screen. They can play as if they were a second local player, and then you can play local multiplayer games without having to be on the same screen at the same time. The only issue with that is that it's contingent on having an external internet connection, even if you're within an earshot's distance of one another or you're connected to local LAN for that matter as well. So Valve should figure out how to make it so that it works via local area network or even by ad hoc. So the final thing to note is that SteamOS 3.0 does not have a definite release date. We don't even know if we're going to get it before we get the Steam Deck for that matter. So also worth mentioning is that the deck, they plan on bringing it to Japan and Australia next, which is good because, you know, if this gets big in Japan, we might get ports of Japanese games that we would never get on PC. Like, you know, Vanillaware games. Please, 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 Sega or Atlas. Or Vanillaware or whoever, whoever, whoever publishes the games nowadays. So Valve also showcased a prototype unit. It's a white Steam Deck. It's the first Steam Deck that wasn't black that we've seen, and it's a Portal-themed Steam Deck. It's got the orange and blue for the Portal colors. It basically looks like a Portal gun-themed Steam Deck, and it's really cool. I want one. Too bad Valve won't sell one right now. Maybe they'll sell one in the future. They're working. They're looking into making colors. And if you know one thing about Nintendo, and their handhelds is that they make a killing off of different colors, different special editions, etc. You know, bundles. The most interesting thing that they talked about in this final section was third-party apps. Applications that don't come directly from Steam. They mentioned not needing to go into dev mode to install things like flat packs, etc. etc. And I've I've installed a few flat packs on my uh, computer, on my Linux computer as I tried out, you know, making videos for y'all. But it seems the method of installing different, well, different stores is a little different than what I had anticipated. And truth be told, there's no way for me to test for it until, 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 until I get my own Steam Deck. In future videos though, I will try to shy away from using command line because that's not what Valve would want you to do on SteamOS. And truth be told, using command line on a handheld system is just asking for trouble, to be honest. As for how to install them and what sort of limitations you may have when installing them, it really depends on how Valve implements it. But generally, it's good news. You can install third-party apps and Valve claims to not make it difficult for anyone on the dev or user side to do so. And there's a dev mode that even users can access on their own retail hardware. And if we need more escalated permissions, we can always go into that dev mode and presumably do whatever we need to do. Keep in mind though that if you break anything, which is very possible if you're given full administrator perms, Valve is not responsible and neither am I. Wow, this has been a long video and the conference is like three hours long, so I'm gonna end it here. I'll see you guys later. I'm still gonna make tutorial videos for you guys. I think there's only two major storefronts that I need to do, but these two are the most contentious due to the controversy that both companies have become mired in. 
one of which is Blizzard and their Battle.net client, which works. I'll put up a video on how to do that after the itch.io video comes out. 